Tazwater relies on data to help keep people and the environment healthy. Poor water quality can have a disastrous impact on a population's health. And the quality of sewage treatment affects our environment and the livability of our state. How do you stay on top of the issues? Science! Watch now and see some of the clever people and ideas using science to deliver for customers every day. All water tastes the same, doesn't it? Well, not really. While pure water has no taste at all, most tap water is sourced from different catchments which can influence the flavour. A glass of water from the tap is more than just H2O molecules. It has dissolved minerals and gases in it which all impact the taste. Sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, chloride bicarbonate and sulphate are just some minerals we get in Tasmania's water systems. Gases are nitrogen, oxygen and carbon dioxide and can impact the taste. What tastes better? Well, much like any food or beverage, it's personal. Tasting water is serious business at Taz Water. There are people whose job it is to taste water every week to ensure that the water is not just safe to drink, but it also tastes good. Things like algae in a river can impact the taste of water from the tap, even after it's been treated. Not everyone can taste compounds such as geosmin and methyl isoborneol, but one in five people can detect a slight swampy taste to their water when they're present. Although it's safe to drink, it's not the nicest taste. A test for geosmin and methyl isoborneol can take a laboratory two weeks to get a result and cost lots of money. Luckily, it can be done instantly by those with a keen sense of taste who can detect compounds down to two parts per billion. That's even at the low end of detection limits for instruments. These titans of tasting make up Tazwater's tasting panel and are our front line in detecting these compounds and other tastes which may impact the enjoyment for people drinking our waters. Probably the best thing is um, tasting different waters from different areas of the state. You wouldn't think of it, it's very diverse from town to town. So I've been doing this now about four or five years, I think we kicked off this taste panel and I reckon I can definitely pick some towns now. Bridport and some of the East Coast waters often have a little bit of a salty hint to them because they're just the fact that they're close to the coastline. Mountain streams right up in the higher places in the state and they're just usually really pristine. I think it's a really useful tool and I like the fact you can actually utilise your taste buds and a bit of a gift of being able to taste these low level uh, flavours and actually use it towards actually making sure we get some early notifications out to our operators. MIB and Jasmine are our two main things we're looking out for. Any other taste that's not desirable. So we're looking for the absence of taste with water. Oh, you have to pace yourself. Um, sometimes when we're doing more than 20 samples, you do get a little bit saturated by the end of the, the tasting. And you might need to stop and pop to the bathroom. <laughs> but <laughs> I actually had no idea what I was being tested for. I got here and Jeremy gave me a couple of glasses of water and asked me to comment on them. <laughs> and so, uh, I had no idea what I was commenting on, but I just said this one tastes dirty, that one tastes a different kind of dirty, and that one's higher and that one's lower, and he was like, okay, cool, welcome to the taste panel. <laughs> <laughs> and our water in Tassie does taste good. Fast-flowing rivers and lots of rocks make our water some of the purest around. There's been loads of Tasmanian water samples that have won awards over the years, including the best municipal water in the world for 2021 at the Berkeley Springs International Water Tasting held in the United States. That went to the water at Ross Arden in the Fingal Valley. Next time you're knocking down a cool glass of Tassie's finest, see if you can taste the different flavour profiles. Every week, Taz Water does over 400 water quality tests to ensure Tasmanians receive safe, clean drinking water. That's tens of thousands of tests a year. How do you get that many samples? Why do you need a blowtorch? Who does all the testing? What are they looking for? So many questions. Let's find out. Taz Water manages 70 drinking water systems across the state that supply drinking water to over 200,000 households and businesses. Each system undergoes a rigorous water quality testing program from the source water to our customer's tap. The Australian Drinking Water Guidelines list specific parameters like metals and E. coli and disinfection byproducts, and they provide a safe limit. So if we test the water and it's within that safe limit, we know the water is safe for our customers. To ensure that water is safe, we also monitor our catchments, we monitor the treatment process, 
and finally we verify it um, out in the network. We're on the road with a water tester around the Hobart reticulation network to see what it takes to conduct a sample that is compliant for lab testing. Turns out cleanliness is the key. I'm Nick, I'm part of the sampling team. So this is one of our typical compliant sample points. Um, we've got those all through the reticulation system statewide. We then, then we grab uh, some water for our pH and our turbidity. So we give these a rinse two or three times. So what we do, we sit the probe in that and let it season for a couple of minutes. We add our reagent, which will turn the water a pink colour if there's a good residual. Yeah, that looks pretty good, what you'd expect from a retic site. So after that we burn the tap now, uh, so that just uh, sterilises the tap to make sure there's no germs on it from the surrounding. So we grab our bottle now um, and you take a lot of care here that you don't touch the top of the bottle or within the lid. So this one will go back to Silks Point uh, and they'll process that and within 24 hours we'll know whether it's microbiologically safe. As the samples arrive at the lab, the Taswater National Association of Testing Authorities accredited lab team swing into action to start the process of analysing each sample. The main test we're performing on the drinking water is a test for E. coli and total coliforms. E. coli basically is a bacteria that has to have come from the gut of either an animal or a human. These are indicative tests that point us to contamination of our water systems. As soon as the samples are logged into our limb system, they're received out here in the lab, brought through to the micro testing room. The test method we use is called defined substrate technology. Basically the sample is poured in a sterile container and a small quantity of media is added to it. We seal those in a little tray which then goes into an incubator for 24 hours. And if there's yellowing that means there's total coliforms in the sample. If those yellow uh, squares actually then fluoresce that's an indicator that there's a coli in the water sample, which is what we don't want in our drinking water, obviously. It's a way of ensuring to our customers that we're doing basically everything we can to make sure our results are valid, reliable, and uh, repeatable as well. So it's about customer confidence. Taswater's testing not only assists with the regulation of safe drinking water, but it also helps the team running the water treatment plants vital information to keep the plants running at an optimal level. Nice work team, samplers and testers on the front line to keep Tasmania's drinking water safe. Sewage isn't just poo, it's anything you flush down your toilet or send down your sink or drains. So it's mostly dirty water. And in Tasmania, we make about 260 litres of sewage per person each a day. Our sewage system is designed to take away toilet paper, human waste and grey water. So remember to only flush the three P's. Pee, poo and paper. Ordinary sewage comes into the system from drains in our homes and businesses before entering a vast network of underground sewer pipes. Toilet, kitchen, bathroom and laundry waste can take many hours to travel through the sewage network before reaching a sewage treatment plant for processing. Sewage is usually treated in two stages, primary, secondary, sometimes tertiary treatment used when needed. Sewage treatment plants can achieve primary treatment in a number of ways. The first stage of the treatment is generally a coarse screen to remove objects that shouldn't be in sewage and can damage the treatment plant, like mobile phones, toys and sanitary products. This is generally followed by a grit removal and primary settling so solids can settle and grease can be skimmed from the surface. By now, around 50 to 70% of suspended solids are removed. Following primary treatment, biological or secondary treatment assists the removal of contaminants and bacteria. This is achieved through the use of microorganisms which gobble up organic matter through an aeration process, which is called activated sludge. Secondary level treatment plants also involve disinfection of effluent prior to discharge or release for reuse by either using chemicals or ultraviolet light. In less populated areas, effluent may be held in lagoons or ponds for several weeks, allowing microorganisms to die off before the effluent is released. 
tertiary treatment is used where the removal of specific wastewater contaminants is required, such as the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Tertiary treatment occurs when further protection of our environment is required, such as for sensitive inland waterways with lower water flows. Although nutrients are vital for sustaining life in waterways, too many can cause an imbalance to the health of the system and this can result in excessive plant and algal growth. After treatment, the treated wastewater is returned to the environment. In a number of instances, TAS Water is able to recycle the treated water and biosolids from treatment plants for suitable agriculture applications. Extreme weather and sensitive environments make the challenge of sewage treatment unique and extra challenging. Cold temperatures, sensitive receiving environments and fluctuating populations make sewage treatment at the iconic Cradle Mountain a marvel of science, engineering and long-term planning. This pristine part of Tasmania once upon a time relied on septic tanks for sewage, which wasn't ideal for the local environment or users. For more than a decade now, customers and tourists in Cradle Mountain have had their 200 kilolitres of sewage each day treated by some very innovative technology. The main star of this attraction is a membrane bioreactor system specially designed to create very low nutrient concentrations, producing such clean effluent it's safe for release into the sensitive environment. Membranes are suspended inside the bioreactor to filter out solids and organic material to an advanced level. Once the sewage is screened, it enters the bioreactors where biomass, or rather, the bugs, need to do their thing, which is feed on organic material in the sewage. In these bioreactors, the sewage is aerated, which provides two functions. One is to supply oxygen to the bugs so they can breathe, and the other is to keep the membranes filtering effectively. The treated sewage passes through the membranes and becomes permeate, which is filtered down to 0.2 microns. The low nutrient effluent is then further disinfected to ensure minimal environmental impact on the pristine sensitive environment. The residual biomass, or bugs, left over are called biosolids and are beneficially used as a soil conditioner in forestry and agriculture. Cradle Mountain has an average winter temperature of just 6 degrees Celsius, which means there are times when the sewage could freeze. Not only can freezing sewage stop the entire plant, but treatment needs warmer temperatures so the biological process in sewage treatment works. We need to keep the bugs happy. So how do you stop that from happening? You do what we all do when we get cold and put the heater on. The sewage is warmed to 15 degrees in the winter to ensure the plant can keep operating. This compact but effective sewage treatment plant is also very low odour and has the capacity to cater for a surge of visitors in the peak tourist seasons. Hi, I'm Kate and I work for TAS Water. Today I'm going to demonstrate for you what goes on behind the scenes at a typical water treatment plant. TAS Water has a really important job to make sure the water is safe for you to drink. I've got four beakers in front of me today. This first one represents rainfall that has fallen clean and fresh from the sky. These next two I'll be adding some clay powder to to represent contamination that might occur in river water from industry, animals and the environment. This fourth beaker here represents the final product of water that's been through a water treatment plant and is safe and ready for people to use. In our beaker of contaminated water here, you can see that some of it has started to settle to the bottom, while the rest of it is floating suspended in the water. This is called turbidity. Before we put it through one of our filters, what we can do to clear it up on top is to add alum. Alum will act like a magnet in the water. It will coat the tiny floating particles allowing them to clump together so they're heavy enough to settle to the bottom. This will leave a clearer layer of water on top that we can then put through a filter. You can see it's starting to look a lot clearer on top because most of the contaminants have settled to the bottom of our beaker. We can make it clearer still by running it through a filter. Most has water treatment plants 
have filters made out of carbon, sand and gravel. So you can see now the water coming out of the bottom of the filter is looking pretty clear. It's looking like tap water. So we've got the filtered water here. And although it looks clean and safe to drink now, TAS water needs to be able to guarantee that it's safe to drink to the furthest house in our network. We can do this by adding chlorine because this will neutralise any microorganisms that might still be in the water. How do we know there's chlorine in the water? What we can do is add this sampling powder to the water, which will make it turn the pink. So this is the process that TAS Water uses to bring safe water to your house. Only about 1% of the world's water can be used to turn into drinking water. So it's really important for TAS Water to work with its communities to look after the natural environment and be mindful of the water that we all use. Okay. You guys ready? The world needs water scientists because... Water scientists around the world are understanding um, risk associated with drinking water, um, for preventing disease, identifying new, new ways and innovative ways of meeting the challenges of our changing world. You need scientists to understand that profile, understand where our risks are and to drive outcomes through engineering or innovative, innovative engineering solutions. We need to continually monitor to make sure drinking water is safe to drink and we're not causing impacts on our environment. What is the coolest science you've seen that has been used to help manage our water and sewage systems? Now, there's a question. Okay, the coolest science I think that I've seen in recent times is when we've done the ATP testing for drinking water to give us that fairly immediate response to see whether our drinking water is contaminated rather than having to wait over a day for a result. Can you explain it? I can explain that. I explain ATP is the cool science that fireflies using using their backsides to glow and we utilize that enzyme to show the presence of living organisms in the water. What cool things have you done at TAS Water as a scientist that you are most proud of? More recently one of the things I enjoyed the most was playing around with a, an underwater drone to understand um, what's in our reservoirs, the risks and without the need to potentially put divers in there. So without the need to put a human body into a reservoir which takes time, money and introduce another risk. With this fun piece of um, equipment, we could instantly see the state and the state at the bottom of our reservoirs. Uh, I think one of the coolest things that I've done whilst at TAS Water is learn olfactometry. So essentially um, having a way to measure the odours that come out of our sewage treatment plants. So everybody expects that sewage treatment plants smell and it's going to be a single source of smell, but actually there's quite unique smells throughout the treatment process. Some of them can actually be fairly pleasant when you get used to it, um, but it enables us to analyse what our odour impact is beyond our boundary that could be impacting our customers. So it's essentially like a backpack that you wear and then a mask and it takes in uh, air from the surrounding environment and it mixes it with a, a tank that you're wearing on your back of uh, clean filtered air and then it measures the intensity of that odour and you can gauge uh, what the character is of the odour, so what type of smell, so is it a rotten egg smell, is it a musky smell and things like that. How will science help us in the future to overcome challenges in water and sewage management? We're in a time now where things are getting quite exciting. Science is moving on fast, our understanding is moving rapidly, so we're getting a better understanding of risk, we're getting better equipment to measure the risk, but also what's happening is Things are starting to become, we're starting to move out from the, the old fashioned way of take a sample, um, analyse and respond. We're now getting into real time sensors and we're really starting to understand that big data, big picture and that's really going to inform our strategies moving forward. So I think that's how science is going to help us meet the challenges.